There's just been a big mining conference here in London and I thought we'd take out a bit of time just to check in to see how successful it was, which gives us an indication as to how those in the mining sector are feeling. John Mayer joins us from SP Angel, who's uh, come from that conference recently, which has been happening. It's the one-to-one -one mining investment conference. How was it this year? Surprisingly buoyant. A lot more companies than we expected, 157 companies and a lot more investors, 560 investors I am told, and in fact judging by how busy it was I would say they were all there. Um, and companies from Australia, Canada, everywhere almost, everywhere except for Russia and the Ukraine of course. Um, and it's, it's a busy place. And I spent two days sitting down talking to investors, talking about the companies that we know and love, uh, and they were surprisingly bullish I found. I mean it felt like we were kind of back in 2008 when we had the, G the global financial yeah. crisis when investors bought stocks when they were low when they'd be hammered down big investment funds were forced sellers because they were they wanted to ensure they had liquidity mm -hmm. in case they had redemptions and they did have redemptions in fact so they had to had to create that liquidity they had to sell stocks that they that they didn't want to sell uh, and the investors came in and bought the market up and, and they made multiple returns. There are still nonetheless headwinds. We are still seeing interest rate rising. Uh, we know that at the consumer end there's a lot of pressure being brought to bear on personal balance sheets. Corporates are finding it tough as well. There's a lot of debt on the balance sheets of many, many people. Um, what is the outlook like? Is it just you think this conference doing well on the back of what have been a two or three years of lean um, goings on because of COVID. Do you think this is just a, um, a getting back to business as normal? Or do you think there is genuinely an appetite, do you think, looking further out than maybe the next couple of quarters uh, and uh, saying that the mining sector is back on track? It depends which part of the mining sector you look at. Uh, times are still quite tough in gold. There's quite a lot of, of cost inflation. Mm -hmm. You have to watch out for that. And yes, you're right to mention debt issues. Uh, norm, in a normal environment, you just generally gets rolled over and you remember the problems Glencore had some years ago with their rolling over their revol revolving credit facilities. That applies to smaller companies as well but, but this doesn't normally collapse a smaller company. The, the guys with the debt have to roll over one way or another. Yes there's sometimes a bit of a cost to it. Normally the, these guys come to their senses and they say well there's no point killing the golden goose. Mm. The gold sector I'd say is, is subdued uh, in fact, Why? That, what is it about that? I mean, you talk about cost inflation. What is it that singles out the gold sector particularly for that problem? Well, gold prices have been slipping back for some time. Right. Yes, it looks like gold prices have turned around, but there just isn't the enthusiasm in gold that we're seeing for battery metals. So there's, there's heat in the sector. For, there's appetite for lithium, for nickel, cobalt, those sorts of metals, even graphite now. Investors are getting their heads around the graphite space, what's good in graphite, what isn't good, and the fact that there is a huge Western world supply deficit for, uh, for graphite that, that is going to be required for the gigafactories that are being built over here. Now, China kind of owns that market at the moment. Same with rare earths. A number of new rare earth companies coming through. Uh, I could name names, but, but I won't right now. Right. And new, shall we say, new technologies. Not exactly new technologies, but reconfiguring existing technologies to extract rare earths, uh, extract lithium, extract other, other metals more cleanly that will work in the, in the Western world. And I think will also be more energy efficient as well. So it may be that as a result of this new demand and new capital in the sector, that actually the traditional pyrometallurgical use of furnaces mm -hmm. might become less, less competitive in China. Was that the theme of the conference more so than other sort of general mining issues? Was it battery metals that took up much of the time and energy amongst the people that were there? Was it other areas? Well, when I sit down with the investors and I talk through the companies that we like, I'm, I'm listening to these guys to find out, well, what, what do they want? Mm. And yes, they're very focused on the battery metals and they're not focused on, on the bulk commodities or, or the other stuff. Uh, copper is always uh, very important. Um, well, I'd like to see these guys investing more in copper exploration, but everybody's looking for resources that, well, they're even coming down to drill targets now, which is where a certain degree of exploration has been done, but the drilling has still yet to happen. Uh, but in reality, everybody wants things that they can 
they can finance where, where they're looking for production within a two or three year period. Um, so we're still a bit short on capital, I would say, in the, in the exploration market. But when we're talking to the majors, we're talking to Rio Tinto, BHP, Anglo-American, they are definitely investing in this area now, which is the first time I've seen that in my, in my career, where they've, where they've started to move more heavily into helping the junior space to make the discoveries that they'll pick up on later on. Mm. Let's bring up a copper chart. We've spoken about this, and we, we've we quite often mention copper, good battery metal, good uh, metal for infrastructure spending generally, I think, isn't it, amongst uh, those that are uh, building schools, hospitals, railroads, and so forth. Um, but it still seems to me, as someone that's outside the sector, I mean, you're intimately involved with it, we haven't yet got, I mean, we're nowhere near the highs that we saw back in March this year at 10,800. This is the LME copper price, 8,033 at the moment. Are you happy where it is, or do you think there is still a misunderstanding about just how much demand there's going to be, which is going to swamp the supply that is coming through? You say there's no exploration. I mean, that itself says a lot about the future. If we're going to get this demand through, how long does it take to build a mine? It's going to be a long while, presumably. So presumably the market is not yet pricing in that imbalance. Many mines from disco first discovery to construction are, can be 10 years. Mm. I think they're going to have to shorten those timescales. A lot of that is permitting issues rather than technical engineering issues. It will still take a few years from first discovery to get any mine into production, let's, let's say three to five years mm. at, at the very least. Um, and and there, there is going to be this supply deficit. So I'm comfortable with the copper price where it is now. It's just over $8,000 a tonne. That's, that's not a bad price by any yeah. means. Just about every copper producer in the world will make reasonable money on that. But it will go higher because there is, there's not much spare stock in the world right now. In fact, we're seeing the price going higher today. There were some statistics that came out in China about the, well, the, the new banks, so the, the, the parastatal banks are now lending money to smaller banks to lend money for finishing apartment blocks, for construction, mm -hmm. and we'll get that construction industry which stalled, get it going again. Uh, and we were quite worried about that. We were saying, well, yeah. if, their industry, if their construction industry is stalled and it's 40% of their whole economy of, of GDP, mm. that's bad for copper. But now that that's restarted, we see that Saini, which make excavators in China, their October sales were up by 8%. That's tw over 20,000 excavators. That tells us that construction is actually beginning to move. You don't buy an excavator unless you've got a job to use it on, especially a new one. Mm. Um, Every, you know, if it's just other, other work, you go and buy something secondhand. But if you're on a new construction site, you need a new excavator for, for technical reasons. Mm. So that is working, and that, that is lifting an, a copper and encouraging the market again. What was the word of the conference about China, generally? Because uh, the COVID policy still seems to be fairly rigorous in its effort to try and clamp down. But here we are now hearing reports that there's record numbers of people with COVID again in China. If they got this zero COVID policy, that's going to shrink the economy again. It does cause us some concern, and we've been talking about this for, for some weeks, that as, well, it's very hard to beat Omicron. If you have any relaxation from a strict zero COVID policy, Omicron is going to run around the economy. It, it, it will evade almost every control. And, and so the Chinese are preparing for it. They're, they're putting more hospital beds in, more field hospitals, stuff like that. They, they know, I mean, it's not easy to beat. Even any vaccination program is still going to struggle with the infection rate. So they, they now know they have to manage it. There, there was a tweet this morning, we're not sure if it's true, about the, Chi but the Chinese government blurring the crowds in, uh, at the Qatar uh, World Cup. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they don't want to see that nobody's wear well, almost nobody's wearing a mask yeah. in the crowd anymore. Mm. Whereas in China, they're all still being forced to obey strict right. restrictions. So. Mm. They're concerned about that, but I think at the end of the day, if they're, if they're ramping up what's going on in the construction industry, there'll be more demand. We know in the West we're building as many wind farms and solar farms as we, as we can. We're connecting up more, more interconnectors, uh, again, cop big copper cabling on that, uh, to ensure better power grid stability, mm. that we are less dependent on gas supplies. In the UK, gas was really used for peak, capa peak power capacity. So we have a lot of, of other, other um, generation power sources. Gas was only just the, the sort of peaks 
So we, we're not really that dependent on it, thankfully. Mm. I was talking the other day to a fund manager in the, in the green space, uh, encouraging this decarbonisation. Uh, it's, it's a fund which is based around the idea that companies are going down this route of zero emissions. Do, is the word at the conference, do you think, accepting the fact that it's going to happen, or are people still believing it's a bit of a pipe dream? Um, I mean, we're talking about renewables more and more, but there's still a battery storage problem, isn't there? There's still a, a fact that you can't get enough rare earths, and the, as we said, copper pot, potentially, to build everything that needs to the infra infrastructure to, um, to provide us with all this power. Are people believing it's really going to happen? Yes, I mean, it, it is. There's, there's a lot of focus now on zero carbon, where people can, or reducing their carbon footprints. They're, the mining industry is moving as fast as it can to find new battery metal sources from various places. There's more government incentives now. We've seen certain companies winning uh, government grants for graphite, for lithium, for graphene even, those sorts of things. Certain companies are looking to build um, grid storage batteries, so Bushveld Minerals with their, their vanadium redox batteries, for example. That's not the only technology, but it's one of the better technologies. Certainly with when it comes to lithium batteries, it's almost impossible to, to replace lithium because it's such a light metal. So that will continue to be used for automotive. There are other there are different chemistries for lithium that you can use. So yes, investors are, are looking to, to take part in this. And there are big funds around there looking for projects that they can finance into production. Finance is an interesting word as well. What are the banks, what's the bank's appetite to lend to these, in some cases, speculative companies with opportunities, what they see as a hole in the ground, effectively, um, to push that ahead and cope with the risk, really, I suppose. Banks are less than happy at the moment to lend money speculatively. Is there money around for these mining companies to push ahead with, with exploration? There are less bank, sort of major high street banks in this space than there were, mm -hmm. but their, their places have been taken up by more aggressive uh, trading organisations. So we're talking about Glencore, Trafigura, Transamine, th those sorts of names, and in fact there are many, many more. And they seem to have quite big pots of cash for fun actual, the actual funding of these projects. And the way they make their money is they take an off-take agreement, maybe a royalty as well, that sort of thing. Um, so they, they're looking at They'll, they'll, they'll put the cash up front and they're looking at a, more at jam tomorrow rather than jam today, which is quite good news. Mm. Um, how you, oh, oh, well, we'll have you back in before Christmas to talk about 2023, but broadly speaking, how are we looking going into next year? Are you happy about the mining space? Are you happy that this recession that we're hearing about is just around the corner for many Western economies? That's not going to derail things too far? I feel a lot more confident today than I did a week ago and two weeks ago. Because of the conference and because of the people you're talking to? Partly because of that, but partly because of the statistics coming out. We right. now see that Germany, well, Germany has a massive loss of confidence, but I happen to know from people talking to Siemens and other companies mm -hmm. like that, that actually they've put in place a lot of measures to manage without Russian gas. They had, Siemens, for example, had been converting a lot of uh, diesel power plants and various yeah. equipment. From, from diesel into gas, and now they're just converting them all back again. Mm. France is doing okay. It's got so much nuclear power um, that they don't really have much of a problem with it. And in fact, they've got power that they can export elsewhere. In the UK, we were worried about blackouts through the winter. That was more because we, didn't, we weren't confident of getting power for Norway. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of hydropower coming through the interconnectors from Norway. It's rained virtually every day since national, the national grid made the statement about their concerns and those reservoirs are back up to full capacity so that's great news for the UK economy. Okay all right John thanks so much indeed uh, talking us through some of the confidence that seems to be returning to the mining sector. That's Sir John Mayer from SB Angel. For more videos from us here at IGTV join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel.